Hi there, this is Kim Doherty, and I'd like to welcome you to the iSchool's LIS Career Podcast Series, where we interview practitioners to learn more about their paths to success. Today, I'm excited to introduce you to iSchool grad Eric Berman, who is the Coordinator of Services to Young Adults for Alameda County Library. Eric has had one of the most fascinating career trajectories I've ever seen uh, since he graduated in 2010. And we're going to ask him to talk a little bit about this, actually a lot. Um, but first, let's start off with Eric, tell us about your official title and sort of what that position entails. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, so I am the coordinator of services to young adults for Alameda County Library also known as the Teen Services Coordinator. Our system uses the two terms interchangeably, which sometimes causes confusion, um, but also makes my business cards very interesting. <laughs> so I kind of have a couple jobs in my current role. My big one is to support our county's teen librarians. We're one of the systems that still has librarians designated to certain age groups. So each of our locations has somebody who's responsible for teen services, usually a librarian. And my job is to give them the tools they need to succeed and to thrive. So a lot of that is support, helping them manage uh, administrative issues, giving them ideas for programs, um, navigating finance, purchasing, but also it's helping them have a vision of the future for both their own personal professional development and also for the teens in their community. Uh, yeah. Um, I was going to ask you, as you've been doing this with the um, systems teen services librarians, have you seen a change in the kinds of um, programs that they're wanting to put on or the issues that are being raised about, you know, we need to address this or, or are things pretty steady? Well, we're in a very interesting position. I've worked all over the Sacramento Valley and now in a couple libraries in the Bay Area. And um, Alameda County has this very interesting blend of new innovative ideas and sort of uh, older idea kind of holdovers from earlier um, like library services best practices. Okay. So I think our librarians are moving forward in fits and starts and they're coming up with great ideas. And then every once in a while, I, um, I have a talk. It's like, you know what? Let's find a new way to offer this service. Huh, interesting. And are your, your contacts, the, the teen um, librarians that you're working with, I'm guessing based on other teen librarians that I have, have um, communicated with, they seem to be incredibly responsive to trying new things, to looking at new ways to connect with teens and young adults. Do you find that? Oh, definitely. Um, they're really looking to try new things. And I've been really fortunate in that um, most of my teen librarians have been hired since I was uh, on the job. So I've got some brand new teen librarians who've got that sort of uh, first job or new job energy. And they're oh. ready and willing to to go forward. But that's really important for me because of the way our system is structured. So while I, um, I'm supporting these teen librarians, they have a direct manager who's the branch manager. Uh -huh. So I can't, like, I can't go and say, do this program or drop this program. Uh, I actually describe myself as much more of a cheerleader than a boss. Um, so I've had to develop a lot of soft skills for this program. That's a, a fascinating managerial challenge um, because I was, I was assuming they all reported to you, but you're sort of the soft leadership, um, mm -hmm. which gets to your point about developing soft skills, which you would very much need. But I'm guessing you're a wonderful backup and, and sort of moral support for yeah. teen services librarians that, that get to work with you. So one of the questions around this that comes up a lot from students who are interested in um, YA services, teen services, is 
what kinds of skills you find are most needed in the job? That it, well, this is interesting because it's really two different jobs. Um, I was thinking I was going to be asking you about your job as a teen librarian, but actually I'm going to ask you about both if I can. From Please your sir. perspective, what about teen librarianship? And from your perspective, what about the very unusual role that you play? Sure. I mean, if I had to give one piece of advice to teen librarians and new teen librarians and, and, and uh, specific, it's the most important thing is to be yourself when you are a teen librarian. And that's the big distinction, I think, between um, uh, teen librarians and other types of librarians. Uh, like, let's be clear, teens assume that any adult that talks to them is probably lying. <laughs> and an idiot. <laughs> yeah. Um, so they're hypersensitive to that stuff. So if you come up and you're acting like their best friend and you hate them, or, you know, you're really, you're getting really into, you say you're really into like uh, Fortnite and you don't even know what that is. They can mm -hmm. tell and they're going to be turned off. Um, but the other half of that is a good teen librarian sort of develops who they want to be as a teen librarian in relationship to those teens. And that's going to be different for every person. Hmm. So um, as a teen librarian, I am kind of like uh, sort of like a big brother, maybe like a gang leader. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I try to like set a tone. I was notorious for showing them bizarre uh, YouTube videos as an introduction <laughs> to my meetings. Actually, a great story about that is uh, we built a teen center in San Jose and I got a group of teens to design it. And we had them present at uh, CLA's professional conference, and he got a chance to speak a little bit about it. And that was the first thing he talked about, was that I made him watch weird Old Spice <laughs> YouTube videos. So you almost need to remember what it feels like to be a teen and, and let that part of you connect with that part of them. Yeah. And what are your interests? What are the things that you're passionate about? Let those guide the projects that you work in. Cool. Um, one thing, there's so many really cool programs people have done uh, in California as teen librarians. But one thing I've really noticed is uh, whenever they talk about the amazing things that their teens are doing, they're passionate about that thing too. You know, they, it, that energy came in part from the teen librarian. Now, sometimes you get dragged along by them, um, but then you find yourself that now you're really into Fortnite and you've never played a video game in your life. <laughs> yeah, I, I would encourage anyone who has never played a video game in their life to consider a different line than teen <laughs> librarianship. Um, I think that be yourself advice is really, really crucial and wise. Because to your point, and having raised a teen, they are so amazing and so wonderful, but boy, do they have a, a detector out for, as you say, when you're not authentic, yeah. when you're trying to bluff your way through to a relationship, they just aren't, aren't for it. And it makes sense because they're looking for an adult that they can trust. Exactly. And I think that's something really important. Um, for everyone to think about is you might be the only teen in their life, the only adult in their life, rather, who doesn't have authority over them. Now, obviously, we can tell them to quit eating Cheetos by the computers, but, <laughs> um, you know, when they're at home, they have to be the dutiful son or daughter. And when they're at school, they've got to be the good student. Where do they learn to be themselves? I mean, when I was a kid, I was able to go out and play in like playgrounds and hang out at my local pizza joint. But those places are diminishing real quickly uh, for our current teens. And they're not always welcome there in the way that they would be by the teen librarian. That's a really good point. I love telling the story about, um, I think they're called the Screechers that malls used to install. Did you ever hear about those? Oh, yeah. Well, out, I'm out in Colorado, and what they do out here is play classical music. Yeah. Well, that's, 
that's more uh, that's more effective. <laughs> what the, are the what are the screechers? So it turns out that as you get older, you can't hear higher registers as well. So what malls were doing was installing these devices in there that played sounds at that really high register. So the it would be really annoying for teens, but you know <laughs> adults with money couldn't hear about it. <laughs> But then what happened is um, the teens learned about that and they started using it as their ringtone. <laughs> they started texting each other in the middle of class. <laughs> That's really smart. And this is one of the great things about teens oh, yeah. is that give them a challenge and they will find a way around it. That is, that is priceless. I love that. But I, I think that your points are so well taken because you're approaching this from Yes, you are the authority figure in the room, but also you are treating them with respect and um, as if you liked teens and you mm -hmm. think they're cool. And to your point, you know, there are not a lot of places where that happens. So that does make that role really special for them. So now I get to ask you about your career trajectory and I get to lead this off, this question all right. with all of the things that you've done. So I have you starting your career as a library page for Yolo County Library, then the branch manager at Calusa County Library, then the youth services librarian at El Dorado County Library, then at the San Jose Public Library for five and a half years where you were librarian, youth, service li youth services librarian and acting senior librarian, and then the coordinator of services to young adults where you are now. Tell us about that. <laughs> <laughs> or as one of my students said to me once when I was talking about all, all of the different careers you could have with information and library skills, and I was charting my career, and she very compassionately said to me, do you ever worry that you don't seem to be able to hold a job? <laughs> <laughs> and I looked at your trajectory and thought, I get this guy, you, you can't resist the next terrific challenge, the next terrific opportunity. So tell us about moving through these jobs and what you were thinking, did you have any concerns or fears that you had to overcome? Tell us about that. Sure, well, I guess I'll start with an admission, which is that when I was in high school and college, I did not think I would be a librarian. In fact, the other huh. day I found a personality test that I'd taken when I was in like fifth grade and I had a list of like a hundred occupations and librarian was the third from the bottom. <laughs> um, which I think is pretty funny. <laughs> Actually, um, it is. <laughs> you know, but I, I did, my, I started out as a page um, as just a after school job just to make some money because I love, I love books. I've always loved books. I've always loved reading. And um, so it just seemed like a natural fit. And um, I had a great time as a page there. I was a page for like eight years and that was probably four years too long because by the end of that, I was like, I was not a good page because I was like tired of that. I was tired of shelving books. I wanted to help. I wanted to run programs. I ended up being taken under the mentorship of the teen librarian there uh -huh. who I did largely because I kept on telling her that she was categorizing the graphic novels all wrong. <laughs> She's like, well, you do it then. Uh, but when I graduated college, I realized I don't want to do what I studied. What was your undergraduate degree? I had a, I had a degree in political science and philosophy. Okay. Um, oh, and I love those. I still love talking about both of those. Um, my focus was on political ethics, which is both relevant and incredibly depressing. Um, <laughs> I can imagine both. <laughs> but it turned out I didn't love writing papers about it. Uh, uh. Uh, but I, I, had, I took a little bit of me time afterwards and I thought really hard and I realized I've been working in libraries for a long time. I could do this forever. Huh? And it was like, like, it was like a revelation. I kind of felt like the sun started shining through the clouds and the birds <laughs> played because... 
this tension I had is like, well, what am I going to do? What sort of job am I going to be uh, like a trucker? Am I going to be a math teacher? I had no <laughs> idea. Um, actually, seriously considered both of those. Um, <laughs> you see, the last job I applied for before I went back to library school was to be a TSA agent. I remember taking that test and I had to look at x-rays and examine what oh was what. Oh my gosh. Um, but just things started working out well. Like I ended up um, knowing somebody who's taking on the role of a uh, county librarian in Calusa County. And she offered me a job there. Uh, and and I went how there. did you know that person? She was a librarian that I worked with in Yolo County. Okay. And okay. I just told her that, hey, I've said I'm going to library school. And I think that's something that's important is that one of the best things about being a librarian, especially a librarian in California, it, or library worker, is that there's this culture of wanting to support you and promote you and get you up. Right. Yeah. Um, anyway, so I started working in Williams, California as the branch manager, which is a lot more impressive until you realize I was the only employee of that library. <laughs> That, you know, thank you for saying that, because the fact that you had gone from being a page to being a branch manager was like the most amazing leap in, in career move I'd ever seen in my life. You know, I say that, but I mean, I was doing everything at that library from cleaning floors to, um, you know, doing the daily cash report to designing programs. I actually found the other day, I designed an entire summer reading program for oh my, my library gosh. system. Like I have this little, it was Passport to Adventure. I think that was like the 2004, <laughs> no, it must've been like 2010 or eight summer reading program. So oh I had my gosh. all these programs. Um, and then- What an, a fantastic experience though, to be able to inhabit all of those different roles. It was so great. I mean, I could get, uh, I could get a class and learn about some new technique learn about folks and armies or something like that. And then the next day I go to work and implement it and try it out. Hmm. Um, wow. And I, I tell you, uh, I was complaining about having to write philosophy papers, but uh, when I went to graduate school, it actually scared me the very first day. Uh, the teacher came in and was like, this is a graduate level program. I expect graduate level work. And it scared the <laughs> crap out of me for four years. Um, but I had such an easier time writing about something that I cared and I loved about. And uh, there were definitely oh. days where I was like, you know, this 12 page paper probably should be like a four page paper. <laughs> <laughs> but it, that makes so much sense because if you are passionate about the work that you're doing and especially in this field versus if you come from a discipline where part of the, the premise is this very rigorous, objective, sort of neutral approach. Um, I can see how much fun it would have been for you to to go through the grad program and do this. It's a totally different type of writing and honestly, way more fun. <laughs> Okay, and so you you were the branch manager at Calusa County, mm -hmm. and then what made you decide to take the job as youth services librarian at El, Dor El Dorado County? Well, there were a couple things. I mean, one, I was the branch manager, but I was working, you know, 20, 30 hours a week, and uh, I was driving out to the middle of nowhere. Uh, Williams, California is uh, about... I want to say 40 miles north of Sacramento on I-5, and it exists because there's an almond field <laughs> and two highways that intersect. Uh, You're right. Really, that's the middle of nowhere. <laughs> there's not a lot of growth prop opportunity. There wasn't a lot of um, ways to like challenge myself or do more than I was doing. Yeah. Um, so I got a job in El Dorado County Library, and in actuality, my job was. 6 to 18, um, which was... 6 years old to 18 years six old. 6 years old to 18 years old. There's a so it was some children's programming, uh, but really the understanding was a lot of desk time and uh, a lot of teen work. Okay. And then a week after I got hired, there's zero to five specialist 
got ill and had to leave. And this El Dorado County, I think is still known today for their amazing children's services and their amazing uh, zero to five services. Uh, Like I think there's someone who pioneered touch points. Oh my gosh. And I think they're the, my director at the time now works for the state library. So, I mean, uh, great, great mentors, great teachers, but what they needed is a zero to five librarian. Hmm. And I was not a zero to five librarian. I learned very quickly. I ended up doing six story times a week, which ah. <laughs> was very, I only had to present four of them, but I had to prepare for the other two um, and do a lot of work. Uh, so it, it didn't work out. It didn't like fit with what they wanted and it fit with what I wanted. So, um, I left that job because otherwise I think they would have gone insane and I definitely would have gone insane. And I think your recognition that you weren't the right person for them in the same way that they weren't the right organization for you is something that people struggle with. They feel like, oh, I took this job, I should stay here, I should try to make it work. But sometimes it's exactly what you experienced. It seems like a good fit at the time, and then maybe circumstances change or other realities come into play, and it's better just to be honest about it. Yeah, and I mean, that, that was, a hard, it was a hard decision. Uh, I definitely regretted a lot of things afterwards, but it was the right looking back at it. Um, I learned a whole lot that I'll never forget. I now own a pirate costume because of them, which is <laughs> sitting in my cubicle. Uh, but um, like leaving that was definitely a good move for me. And then did you go pretty much directly from El Dorado to the San Jose Public Library jobs? No, then there was a, a definite period of time trying to find a new position. Ah. Um, and, you know, th- this was a time right when um, a lot of librarians who would normally be retiring were staying on a couple extra years. Ah, uh, yes. Just to, uh, just till everything kind of recovered a little bit. Mm-hmm. And um, it was a hard struggle. I interviewed a ton of times. I actually um, interviewed for jobs out of state. I drove up to Washington for like wow. the weirdest interview I've ever done. <laughs> they, um, they, they sat me down and they gave me a, a pile of six books that I'd never seen before. And they said, what age, ta- what age group is each of these books for and how would you book talk to them? You have a five minutes. Oh my gosh. And then they said, all right, read one of these books. It's a, do a story time to us. And then they acted like children. <clears throat> They're like, he's hitting me. Can I have a cookie? <laughs> you know, I have to say, if you're thinking, okay, this is the management team, this is not really confidence inspiring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but I was fortunate in that um, San Jose was beginning to expand after the Great Recession, Mm. um, they'd actually built four library buildings that were brand new and ready to go because of bond money. And then they had no money to hire librarians or staff for those buildings. Um, So I was brought on basically to help open those libraries. Um, And in particular, the Educational Park Branch, which uh, is was right next to the largest school in San Jose and one of the largest high schools in the, the state. And was there a lot of collaboration with their school librarians? No, there really wasn't. They didn't have a school librarian. They had a librarian huh. that had, um, I think, four schools that oh they gosh. went to. So they were open like one day a week. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So we were the school library. Yeah, I can see. And after school, the library was the teen center. Huh. But that was a great opportunity it was really the place where i sort of thrived and learned like to be a librarian um so where all my training and everything all had gelled into one um i was able to form some great bonds with the librarian with the librarians but great bonds with the teens who were there too um we formed wow. a teen advisory group 
that was robust enough that I decided they needed to write a constitution. Um, wow. Which they wrote. We had like constitution conventions. Um, we advertised and, and let all the teens in the library vote on it. We had a signing day and first elections. Um, it was a pretty big deal. It was fun. I think I still have the original copy of the constitution and the fancy pen I bought so they could buy it. Oh, so I'm going to ask you a question here about teen advisory groups. That's a question that has come up with a, a couple of classes that I've taught where the question is, would teens, if, if there's a good relationship between, say, the teens who are using the library and the teen services librarian, do you think most teens appreciate and like the idea of having a teen advisory group so that they, they have more of a, a stake in outcomes and program decisions and things like that? That's a good question. I think, I think there's two parts to it. I don't think a lot of the teens are thinking that hard about the process. Okay. And I think there's some um, sort of not understanding the world to it. We're like, well, yeah, if I want a program, I could just tell the teen librarian and he'll do it regardless of the tag. Okay. But I think it's more important for the teen librarian to have because it's yeah. hard to keep your pulse on what's popular. And a teen advisory group will keep you honest. They will help let you know if you're on the right track and not maybe directly, but also just by their interest and by the things that they say and the things that they're interested in. If you're really clued into it, you're going to learn about, you know, TikTok before everybody starts using it. Right. You're going to learn about the next thing that every teen's going to use. So you don't feel like an idiot when you're still using Facebook and no teen uses that except talking to their grandma. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, this this make you a very valuable friend to have um, for parents who could just sit you down with coffee and say, okay, tell me everything I need to know so I don't sound like an idiot to my kiddos. I mean, unfortunately, I don't get to work with teens as much. So I, I'm, I feel, I, I get, I feel old too. I think I'm, I'm one wrong comment away from being okay boomered. <laughs> well, and it would be so easy to have that happen. Although it's sort of a case of if you have, at least from my experience, it's been, if you have done the work of setting up essentially a trust relationship with the group of teens that you're working with or, or attempting to work with, and you've made it clear to them you're making a good faith effort, that OK Boomer crack might be said with a smile rather than totally just rolled eyes and disgust. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the key, knowing, knowing when, it's, when you have to re-examine your life and when they're just giving you a hard time. Right, exactly. And, and teens can be so good at that. Um, so a question about the jobs that you were applying for and the jobs that you eventually got. Were you applying to job openings online? Were you sending in applications? Or were you sort of networking into these jobs because you knew someone there? Most of you said that that was the case for the branch, branch manager at Calusa, but how about the rest of them? Um, the rest were almost all started, at least started out through online um, applications. Okay. There were a couple jobs that I knew somebody or my parent knew somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody is like, oh yeah, this library is looking for a job. And then I go and look at, it's like, this is an academic librarian <laughs> position in the international like library of wheat or something. So uh, good intentions, but not always on target. Yeah. And I mean, I'll say what I, what I tell new librarians is networking is key because I have seen basically jobs go to people, qualified people, but that, that extra push was because they knew somebody. Mm -hmm. um, and the community of librarians in California is small. You learn these people, get to know them, um, and that'll open doors for you that you can get if you go through the, you know, the application process and send 
400 applications out, but um, getting to know people helps so much and I'm so terrible at it. You know, I think most of us are, and, and this is an ongoing issue for those of us who tend not to be wild extroverts. Yes. Um, you, you are so correct that building your network of professional relationships and connections is, as you go through your career, it gets to be the thing that opens up opportunities for you because eventually you sort of reach this tipping point and it sounds to me like you're pretty much there um, where instead of someone you know saying someone to you saying to you Eric you might want to know about this job opening at XYZ what eventually starts to happen when your network builds is that at at library XYZ there's a conversation going on. We know, need to find somebody who can do this. And somebody in that, that conversation says, we need to talk to Eric Berman. And, and those people start reaching out to you. That's why, from my perspective, building a professional network and, and having those be authentic relationships of, of mutual support is, is just incredibly powerful. Yeah, and I mean, the first people who are going to know when your dream job opens up, it's the people who are working in that library. Yes. I yep. mean, I just made fun of Facebook the other day, or uh, the Facebook, but um, I see tons of opportunities being posted on people's, you know, personal Facebooks for the libraries they work in. And, um, you know, you don't see those, but like if I applied to a job and, um, it's already got friends of mine who I know mm -hmm. just through the library mm -hmm. already know a little bit about the system, how good a fit it can be and also sort of how to tailor my strengths to meet what they're looking forward. Right. It's so sort of those insider insights mm -hmm. that allow you to align your strengths with their need. Um, you made a really interesting point there and that when, when you refer to those jobs on Facebook, a lot of times people who know a lot of people in the profession end up getting what's called invisible jobs because they never get posted. You know, mm -hmm. the, the director or somebody else will say, this is what we need. And they, that job might get posted, but you will hear about it first because quite frankly, you might be the perfect person for the job. So when you think about networking and building a community of colleagues, how do you do that? Do you do that through being active in professional associations or other ways? It's so hard. Um, I, I would, this is what I, this is my technique and this is a technique, so I don't want this to be considered writ of law. Um, <laughs> I, I made a couple decisions. decisions. Uh, about networking and one of them was that I would get really deeply into one professional organization. I, it's like I had the capacity for one. Mm -hmm. So I got really deeply into CLA. And so okay. I've been the chair or vice chair of the Youth service interest group for a long time. And that, that spun out into being uh, part of the conference planning committee. And now I'm the chair of the membership committee. And um, hopefully I continue to be active in CLA and Every step from there, I've learned more and more people. One of my best friends in the library business, uh, I met through the Youth Service Interest Group and um, people who I've kind of grown up with knowing or talking to at countless CLAs now are now directors and CLA board members um, just because I've spent some time with them. Mm -hmm. And one thing about CLA and professional organizations in general is they're super scary to try to join. Like you feel like there's this huge, big barrier or there's like a click. It's like, oh man, only yeah. Eric and his friends get into CLA. All these people and, know each other and I'm a total stranger. Yeah. It turns out like, I'm telling you this cause I'm actively recruiting people. Like we want you, <laughs> I don't care who you are. <laughs> Come email me when you hear this podcast, I will find a position in a committee that I know to be part of cause that's what we want. We want people who are passionate about it. Um, there's no clicks in CLA that I know of. It's just, please join us. 
Um, and, and I'm going to back up Eric's pitch um, for students joining CLA as well, because when you do, a couple of things happen. One is exactly what Eric has just described, which is by working as a volunteer, it's the easiest way in the world for introverts to make friends and build relationships because it's not awkward. You're not a stranger. You guys have the same thing that you're working towards. So it's for those of you who consider yourself introverts and you're kind of wondering how the heck am I going to build a network, join CLA and volunteer. The second thing is if you join CLA, you will be able to see their members, the, who all of their members are. And that makes it easier to see who's got what jobs and who's working at what libraries where you may want to do an informational interview perhaps with them. So there are huge benefits to belonging to a professional association and coming from me, someone who does not live in California, I would tell you that the California Library Association is nationally known you guys are amazing. So that I think that's fascinating. And that's exactly the same way I sort of started building my uh, professional network was by joining an association and volunteering. Because I, I was like what Eric is saying, where you feel like everyone there knows each other, except for you. And you're this weird outsider with like a neon flashing sign that says, nerd or weird or too shy or whatever but but really eric is spot on this is just the most valuable thing you can do for your career so seconding eric's uh, pitch there not just because he's a membership chair i would encourage all of you who are listening to this podcast at any point to join cla especially if you're a student all right so next question is because you have done so many interesting things and, and different things as you've been going through your career, when you graduated and took on, it was probably the, the new job of branch manager at Calusa, I'm thinking, did anything surprise you about the work that you were doing or the work environments? Huh. Um. I think the biggest thing that continues to surprise me, I mean, I, I became a librarian. Well, I, I started working in a library because I liked books. And in somewhere in the back of my head for a big chunk of my library school, I was like, yeah, like I'm going to be a library. I'm going to be a teen librarian for a couple of years because I love comic books. I want to get old. I'm going to be an adult services librarian. And, you know, that, that's what I'm going to do. Um, but actually it's, largely thanks to Anthony Bernier's uh, youth, youth service and youth programming class. I forget the number now. Um, being a librarian, especially now, is about people. Like mm -hmm. the books and the technology are there, but it's so much, and especially if you're a teen librarian, about the people that you work with, the people that you're serving, the teens and the partners. That's really what you do. Um, I think a lot of that has to do with how fast computers have taken away a lot of what librarians used to be, used to have to be experts in. I mean, fascinating. I know the Dewey Decimal System pretty well because I spent eight years as a page shelving books and I saw every one of the books in that library. But we got Google now, we got OPAX. Uh, the real deep dive stuff not every librarian has to be an expert in it anymore. You got to know how it works. You got to know the systems. Um, but I took a look at a old green book that was a test book for librarians from like the 1990s. And wow. The, uh, the questions were like, which online or which service would you use to find geographic records? And it listed four or five options. And I didn't know any of them. And I don't oh need to because. Oh, my gosh. I know how to go and find the information through databases now. Um, but, but that test can't tell you how to work with somebody, how to work with a teen who's homeless. 
yeah. or somebody who's concerned about coming out or has questions about their gender identity. Um, I just dropped big, big teen topics on you, but you know, those are the, those are the, those are our challenges now. Yep. And yep. it's way more rewarding. Like I love helping somebody find the name of that book. I don't know what color, it, I don't know what it was about, but the cover was blue. <laughs> So my favorite story about that is somebody misremembered the title of their book. They were adamant that it was this one title <laughs> and it, that, it was wrong. <laughs> and I figured it out through some very clever, clever Googling and catalog searching. <laughs> and they were like, could not believe it. It's like but, magic. You were doing magic. Yeah. But I think the impact I have with the teens that I work with is way more important than that. And even the little things. You know, I think, and, and this gets back to what you said earlier about needing to learn soft skills. We, I, I know in, in grad school, we spent a lot of time talking about the reference interview and how to do that, um, which makes sense. I think it, it's wise to do that. But to your point, more and more of what we're doing in libraries is being on the front lines of huge social change. Yeah. And in order to be able to do that effectively and empathetically, it's not so much that you, you know all the tools as that you are willing to listen and and put yourself in that other person's shoes and think, what does this person need? How, how can I help? And that's so different than just to your point, pulling a book off the shelf and, or saying, here, there's a great book on that. Let me go get that for you and mm -hmm. giving them a book. So how have you learned to develop your soft skills? Just trial and error and, and learning what worked and what didn't. So, I think there are a couple things. Um, so one is I have this passion for library services and helping me. And um, it's definitely, it's definitely the iSchool's fault. Uh, <laughs> it, it's Anthony Bernier's fault uh, who really turned me into a bit of an iconoclast about the importance of teen services and the importance of us serving things to teens. Um, so that, that helps. That actually helps me a lot getting over my incredible amount of introversion myself. <laughs> um, I took like a nonprofit marketing class, and ah. in, in the high school, which was I have two books on my shelf from the library, library school, and one of the the only t actual textbook that I have is the strategic marketing for nonprofit organizations textbook that I bought for that class. Hmm. Um, and learn so many of those soft skills and those people things, like how do you approach and talk to people and how do you promote your stuff to people? Um, and also working in small groups. I mean, uh -huh. when I was in library school, I was like, all right, I know I have to prove have small group experience for my portfolio, <laughs> but like, why does every class have a group project? <laughs> and then I graduated and 80% of my job is working in small groups. Um, for, for those of you who are still students uh, in the iSchool program, um, Eric, I'm guessing that you didn't have him for a, a teacher, but one of the adjunct faculty members at the iSchool is Scott Brown, and I remember him telling me when I was talking about group projects that his favorite quote is that life is a group project. That's true. <laughs> Although, huh. they, you know, I think they're easier when they're face-to-face -face rather than as a student. Mm -hmm. and, and you have to put work into them, too. Um, I did pretty good in library school because, again, I, ca I cared about it. Um, but one of my very first group projects, my whole group got together and, like, we're all smart people. We can do this. Let's divide <laughs> the work, and we'll come back in three weeks. I'm telling you that didn't work. <laughs> and my best project was one where I sat them down. It was like right after that, I was like, listen, last time I tried this, it totally screwed up. So 
here's the dates. This is our rotation. These are our responsibilities. It's going to rotate in this way. We're going to have two check-in meetings a week. We're going to have this work done on these days. And I think we were the top of the class. That was, is really smart. Yeah, it was, it was really good. Um, and both of those people, by the way, who were in that, ended up being hired and working at San Jose when I was there. Oh, that is so cool. That was a lot of fun. That is cool. So it sounds like you are, let's see, I wouldn't, I, I would say two things. One, you are good at, you're adept at, and two, you are accepting of the need to keep growing professionally oh. and, and keep developing new skills to meet new requirements as your job evolves. Absolutely. And you have to, like, uh, as librarians, we're going to have to keep on evolving. There's big revelations in how our service is going to change coming up anyway. Um, I think VR technology, like augmented reality, Google glasses that actually don't look awful, <laughs> that's going to transform everybody's lives. And that's going to transform everybody's lives in our lifetime. Um, Makerspaces, that's the new hot thing. I didn't know anything about makerspaces. I didn't even know what the 3D printer was, and mm. I've now built two makerspaces. Oh, my gosh. Um, the first one was a very interesting experience. <laughs> we call uh, those learning experiences. <laughs> yeah, I learned a lot, but also helped with the second one, and um, we were able to improve a lot and get a lot closer to what my ideal would be. Um, but also just where does our role fit in in the social environment of of the country where do libraries fit into that um you know there's a lot of needs that are being unfulfilled and libraries have fit to meet those needs but when does that mean that we stop doing our core service of right. bringing information to people right. or does that mean that or is that just do we sort of redefine ourselves again that stuff's I, all coming up. Yep. I think those are really, really great points because that need isn't going away anytime soon. And so libraries need to decide, do we prioritize one type of service to a certain type of constituency and let go of something else that we're doing? So what's the lost opportunity cost? Mm -hmm. Or do we try to somehow grow our bandwidth so that we can respond to what are clearly um, very strong needs within our communities. It, uh, from my perspective, that's if you're working in libraries or if you're teaching in a grad school on libraries, that's kind of the big question that everybody's struggling with is the nature and role of public libraries now that we're sort of starting to realize that our positive impact is could be so large if we had that kind of bandwidth that where do we draw the boundaries of and you know, where we don't go, what we don't do. And I'll add in that um, I think academic libraries are facing a very similar role. There's a lot of talk about turning academic libraries into third spaces. Oh, um, interesting. And I mean, third space that came from academic libraries and academic like research, uh, though I think it's really important for teen libraries. Uh, real quickly, a third space, if you're not familiar, this is the idea that you have a home life and a home identity and a work or school life and school identity, and you have to conform to certain things in each of those. And a third space is a place where you can be yourself, where there's none of the home or work expectations. Mm -hmm. Somebody once described third place spaces to me as think of British pubs where yeah, pe that people just so go well. hang out. Yeah. Interesting. Um, but they're transforming. I know San Jose State, um, actually, after we built our makerspace, the, the library, state library, or the uh, university library there talked to us and ended up building some of the same technology that we had in for their makerspace and their e-resources. Interesting. Interesting. Which is sort of another thing that's a, a trend is this sort of overlapping 
um, we're starting to sort of lose boundaries that mm -hmm. this is academic, this is public, this is school, and we're losing boundaries that you learn at this stage of your life, you work at this stage of your life, you retire at this stage of your life. So there's much more of a flow, which is wonderful, but again, it's a shift in what the expectations are of public libraries and how we respond to those expectations. So clearly, Eric, I could keep you on this interview for the next three hours. This is fascinating <laughs> to me hearing what your viewpoints are. But I, I will ask you one last question because I think you are uniquely suited to provide insight on this. What advice would you give students still in grad school in terms of positioning themselves for jobs when they graduate? And that could be should they join associations? Should they do an internship? Uh, what classes should they take? Just anything that you think would be helpful for them to sort of be thinking about. Sure. Um, I think the very first thing to do is I encourage you all to take weird classes. Uh, focus and take some stuff outside of your focus area. I kind of knew that I wanted to be a teen service librarian and do some management work. So that was almost all my classes. But I really regret not taking more cataloging classes and um, classes that were sort of outside that public library area. The more well-rounded you are, the better chances you have of finding your ideal job. I think if you could start working or volunteering in a library as a student, your life's going to be so much easier. You're going to be able to apply things you've learned and see the actual applications to the things that you're learning, it's like, oh, well, this is how a reference interview works because I did one yesterday. Um, be game for anything because we're changing what things look like. We're changing what libraries look like. Um, I'll tell you one thing, like I've been, obviously teen librarians are gonna do a bunch of weird stuff, you know, <laughs> virtual reality, candy sushi making contest, movies, but Children's librarians are doing that too. Some of our children's librarians are now running a lunch at the library program, which means they have serve safe food certifications and making sandwiches for people. Oh, wow. Um, tons of outreach work and being in different places, doing library services in jails and parks and community centers. Like be game for that and be ready and prepared. Um, and then also when you get your first job, just, uh, I don't know how to describe this, but so many, so many libraries will have a ton of part-time work and um, be careful about that because if you want a full-time job, there might not be an option. They might have to work part-time and um, it's, I've seen a lot of librarians who they'll leave a position after a couple months because they can't afford to live on that part-time work. So I guess, I guess my original thought was to be a stronger call to just be cognizant of that, but just, just uh, know that there's different types of positions that people are hiring for. And um, you want to make sure you're doing something that you can do in the long run. And, and so I'm going to ask you a pretty specific question here, Eric. Um, would you say that for a student who's looking for that first foot in the door job, they would be wiser to not take a part-time job or perhaps to go ahead and take that part-time job, but keep looking for a full-time job? I on, think, the, on the assumption that that part-time job probably isn't going to turn into on its own a full-time job? Yeah, I think maybe that's more of what I, I was getting toward. Um, yeah, I would say a part-time job rarely parlays straight to a full-time position. I, I don't think I've seen it happen more than a handful of times in all the libraries that I've worked in. Um, you... If you take a part-time job, know that it's going to stay that way until you find another position. So, um, I think that's really good advice. And I, I would add to that another thing that happens 
if it does convert from a part-time job into a full-time job is that the salary is going to be sort of based on what you were making as a part-time person. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you keep looking for that full-time job, you're probably likelier to find a better salary if you're coming in as a full-time position. Yeah. And the other thing, um, and now we're getting into the end of discussion at Eric ranting position. Um, <laughs> if you work 50 hours a week on your 40 hour or 20 hour job, if you, if you're buying like Oreos to do your team program, because there's no money in the budget for Oreos for your team program, like that's not going to help you advance. That's just going to help you burn out faster. Um, there's one of the things like teacher culture, the library culture has is, you know, oh, you know, just put in a little extra effort. You know, let's go buy some Oreos because it's easier than going through our finance department. But that doesn't help you in your career. It's bad for your mental health. It's bad for um, like your, your profession in the library. It might get you into trouble. Uh, so don't do that. I think that's great advice because you, what you do when you do that, well, as you say, with the best of intentions, is you set an expectation that you do work 55 hours instead of 40 for no mm -hmm. extra pay, that they don't need to hire a second person because you'll just keep taking on all of these other um, responsibilities. It's a difficult situation, but I'm really, really glad that you brought it up. Um, there's a, a term I know you're familiar with it called vocational awe, mm -hmm. A-W-E. And, and for the students who are listening, um, I, I would say, and clearly Eric is saying that, you know, being a public librarian in the right role for you is like the coolest job in the world. But there is also a thing that we buy into, very understandably, a mindset and an emotional engagement that we, because we can help people, we should help people. And it's a vocation and calling for us to do that rather than a career or a job or a professional choice. It's important to love what we do but it is also important not to let that be used against us in terms of our own professional respect, what we get paid, what we're willing to do and not willing to do. To Eric's point, I couldn't agree with you more, Eric. It's important to set those boundaries. Yeah. And maybe that's the whole point of that. Just know that you should set boundaries and that you can set boundaries. Mm-hmm. A really good point. Well, Eric, thank you more than I can say for chatting with us today. And I have like 5,000 other questions, but I'm, I'm going <laughs> to let you go back to work now. <laughs> thank you for sharing your insights with us. And on behalf of the iSchool students, thank you so much. And we all look forward to staying in touch with you. I had a great time. Thank you so much for having me here. All right. Take care. Bye bye. Goodbye.